Good morning. It is February 6th, and I have managed to survive whatever plague I had. So I want to apologize for being so scarce, but we're on the mend. So I want to make a video today. It's going to be pretty short about um, what's going on with the Renaissance and religion uh, during uh, the 1600s, 1500s. <clears throat> so just briefly about the Renaissance, um, there are a couple of really important things you should know. Uh, the first thing you should know is the philosophy of humanism. Uh, it used to be that it was just enough to wake up and be alive. Uh, that was the common thought process in the Middle Ages or the medieval period. But when we get to the Renaissance, uh, there's this focus on what makes a person a person. So. <clears throat> It's not enough just to be alive. You now have to be alive and make something of your life. Another part of this idea of humanism, uh, there's this rediscovery of ancient Greek and Roman works, uh, ancient Greek and Roman um, philosophies, ancient Greek and ancient Roman literature, ancient Greek and ancient Roman uh, artwork even. And the people of the Renaissance just fall in love with it and they want to replicate it and emulate it. Because they're so focused on Greek and Roman times, they're not so worried about Christianity. Uh, the people of the Renaissance are still good Christians, but they're going to view Christianity through a, a slightly different lens, uh, based more on the world around them instead of just a, a strictly uh, medieval way of looking at it. Two names you should know. Uh, one is named Erasmus and the other one is Machiavelli. Erasmus is one of the best known religious and philosophers, religious figures and philosophers of the day. And what Erasmus tried to do is take the Greek and Latin humanism and expand that to work within the Christian frame. And he ended up coming up with a new version of the Christian Bible, uh, writing a lot of works on how the Christian church fits into uh, a humanist society. Machiavelli he wrote really the first political science book. So if you're somebody who likes political science, uh, you should go back and read his book called The Prince. Uh, Machiavelli wrote this for a family called the De Medicis. <clears throat> the De Medicis, they ran the city of Venice. And the De Medici family were also the personal bankers for the, the uh, Catholic Church and the Pope. And <clears throat> what Machiavelli was trying to do was demonstrate and hypothesize the best way to rule. And he basically says that it's okay to give the people what they want, but if they get out of control, it is okay to kind of put them back in their place. So a little bit of murder is okay and a little bit of handouts okay. Uh, Machiavelli would just say find a happy medium there somewhere. Renaissance art, and let me see if I move my little bubble here. Renaissance art, some of the most famous art in history. Uh, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Donatello, Raphael. This is when the Ninja Turtles are active sculpting, sculpting and painting. Uh, these artists are going to do this for personal recognition and personal finance. Uh, instead of doing art for the church, they do art for themselves, and they want to do the best art they can, and they want to um, <clears throat> like advertise their art so they can get more work. They also are going to depict people very realistically. Uh, this picture, or this image down at the bottom right, this is the Pieta by Michelangelo. And when it was originally un unveiled, people actually thought Raphael did it, and <clears throat> this made Michelangelo so angry that in the middle of the night he broke in the church and he put his name on it because he wanted the recognition. The other thing about this, the images are very realistic looking. It almost looks like real people. Uh, Michelangelo, believe it or not, was a grave robber. He would pay people to dig up corpses, bring them to his workshop. Michelangelo would actually dissect them to make sure that they were that he could depict people realistically. You also get the use of perspective. You get, the, you get some of the first 3D images in the art world during Renaissance art as well. 
All right, um, related, scientific revolution. This is going to happen around the same time as the Renaissance. And we're going to switch our scientific minds to a math-based science. And some of the big names here are Copernicus, Galileo, Isaac Newton, Leibniz, um, several people. Um, these are just a few of them. Uh, Copernicus is the first one to look at the stars and hypothesize that the sun is the center of the solar system. Galileo will take that a little step further. He develops a telescope. He will use a telescope to um, you know, observe the stars, and he says, yes, Copernicus was absolutely right, and he formally publishes papers that state the Earth goes around the sun. As a thank you for Galileo's trouble and efforts, the Catholic Church arrests him, forces him to uh, re recant everything that he came up with, and then keep him under house arrest for the remaining part of his life. Isaac Newton develops calculus. Did Isaac Newton actually have an apple fall in his head? Probably not, but he does use calculus to explain motion. Uh, that's actually what calculus does. It gives scientists formulas to explain planetary motion and to put things into motion. From there, Newton's going to come up with a new branch of physics called Newtonian physics. And he's going to write one of the most important books of all time, the Principia Mathematica, or the Principle of Math. This is just a list of some other things here. Um, at the same time that uh, we're discovering heliocentrism and physics and calculus, we're inventing some things. The barometer tells you the pressure in the air. Telescope lets you see things far away. Microscope lets you see things really small. Thermometer, you know what the temperature is outside. Scientific academies, these are groups of scientists that get together and talk and debate and work together. Uh, the two most famous ones were the Royal Society of London and the Paris Academy of Sciences. Um, ironically, these scientists are doing a lot of their work in coffee shops, especially in the United Kingdom or England. Coffee shops become the place where these meetings are held, of uh, the scientific academies. Coffee shops are where... Um, ideas are bounced around on each other. And it's even thought that the Principia Mathematica was written in a coffee shop. Um, the Reformation. Uh, this is where we get into some religion. Uh, Reformation happens right around the same time as the Renaissance as well. Um, there had been some people very upset with the Catholic Church for a couple hundred years. And by the early 1500s, it comes to a head, and um, something has to change. <clears throat> now, what were the things that people were angry about? Uh, clerical ignorance. Because the Black Death or the plague killed so many people, uh, the Catholic Church was just hiring anybody they could, whether they knew the Catholic liturgy or how to run a service or a mass or not. As more and more people learned to read Latin, and as more and more um, languages had the Bible translated into them, more and more people realized that the Catholic Church had a lot of phonies in it. Uh, infidelity. Uh, a Catholic priest is not supposed to be married, definitely not supposed to have kids. Uh, they're not supposed to uh, drink or, or anything like that. We had priests and, and cardinals with kids all over the place. In fact, several popes had kids, and that's not supposed to happen. Now, there were many reformers, but the best-known reformer is going to be Martin Luther. On October 31st, 1517, yes, that's Halloween 1517, Martin Luther is going to put a list of 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Castle. And I know that sounds weird, but that was actually a normal way of displaying information of the day. And in the 95 Theses, Martin Luther is going to argue that the church has gone corrupt, that the Pope is not always correct, and that the idea of selling an indulgence is wrong. Now, if you're curious what an indulgence is, uh, the easiest way I can explain it is a get-out-of-hell-free card. Much like a get-out-of-jail-free card, you might find a monopoly. If you bought an indulgence, you were saved. If you bought an indulgence, you were forgiven. You didn't actually have to ask for forgiveness. You just had to pay money. 
And Martin Luther's going to say, that's not how this is supposed to work. And he comes up with this revolutionary idea called salvation by faith alone. Meaning you just have to believe and have a personal responsibility and a personal um, a personal agreement with God. And today, in 2024, that still is the basis of today's Lutheran church. In response to Martin Luther, uh, the Catholic church kind of splits and half of the Catholics become Lutherans and the Protestant Reformation happens. The Catholic church is going to spend some time in looking at what happened. And this is known as the Catholic Counter-Reformation. And they're basically going to say, we're right, everybody else is wrong. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. This leads to some wars of religion. Um, now, believe it or not, these wars of religion don't just happen for a religious reason. Uh, you have to throw in some capitalism in there, uh, some self-determination, some democracy, and even some nationalism. And for a lot of political leaders, these wars of religion are more a uh, struggle between church and state than church and church. And Europe is really going to be split into three groups. A Catholic group, a Protestant group, and then an other group, as I like to call it. It's just a list of wars of religion here. Um, the French Civil War, 1572 to 1598. You have French Catholics versus French Huguenots. Uh, Huguenot is basically a French Presbyterian. And King Henry of Navarre marries Margaret of Valois. And <clears throat> Catherine de' Medici is going to organize an assassination and blame it on, on some royals. And before you know it, there's a huge massacre with thousands of people killed in uh, religion being used as the reason. In 1598, this war is put to end by something called the Edict of Nantes, which for a, at least a little while guaranteed religious freedom in France. It doesn't last forever, but it lasts for a couple of years. From 1565 to 1609, there's the Dutch War of Independence. The Netherlands used to be part of the Spanish Empire, and the Dutch are going to join Protestant forces, and the King of Spain tries to force them to convert back to Catholicism. And instead of converting back to Catholicism, the Dutch provinces are going to declare independence. The English Civil War, even that is partially a war of religion. Uh, <clears throat> King James I, openly Catholic, even though Henry VIII has taken England out of the Catholic Church. And there were real fears that King James I was going to force Catholicism back on everybody. So Parliament is going to take over the country when King James I has a son. This leads to a giant war, a 10-year-long period of time known as the Interregnum, where this dictator named Oliver Cromwell is going to be in charge of England. Oliver Cromwell is pretty uh, unilaterally hated. In fact, when Oliver Cromwell dies, the people of England beg for the king to come back. Well, King James I, he's lost his head over the, th the full thing. So the son of James I, who is James II, becomes the king instead. Now, the longest and most important of the religious wars is the Thirty Years' War, and it goes from 1618 to 1648. Now, I could do an entire lecture on this war alone, but because I'm so far behind on videos, I don't want to bore you. I'll make sure that you watch these. So I'm just going to go over the main parts. Um, there was a, a kingdom in the middle of Europe called the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire was not a united kingdom. There were small little kingdoms that all worked together and they elected together a, an emperor. Well, one of the kingdoms decided they didn't want to be Catholic anymore. And so they left the Catholic Church and became Protestant. And that's the kingdom of Bohemia. Ferdinand II, who is the Holy Roman Emperor, is going to send some people to Bohemia and demand that they go back to the Catholic Church. 
as a thank you for their visit, the representatives of Ferdinand II are shoved out of a second story window. And that becomes known as the defenestration of Prague. Before you know it, armies from all over Europe are going to start meeting in the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, we've got the Habsburg dynasty fighting Denmark and Sweden and Bohemia and France and Austria is going to get involved. It becomes a whole mess. It's really, really interesting to, uh, to read about. Uh, it also goes back and forth. Um, <clears throat> it's not clear for a while who's going to win. It ends, though, with something called the Treaty of Westphalia, and that's in 1648. And what the Treaty of Westphalia did is it gave each of the individual kingdoms of the Holy Roman Empire permission to make its own peace treaty and its own diplomacy with other countries. So the, <coughs> so the power of the Holy Roman Emperor is vastly reduced. Each of these individual kingdoms is going to be allowed to choose what religion they want to be, whether it's Catholic, Lutheran, or now Calvinist. And Switzerland becomes a neutral country and has been neutral since 1648. This is just a visual representation of how messed up the Thirty Years' War was. Um, <clears throat> the right-hand side, this is what the, the Holy Roman Empire looked like. Each of these different names, Saxony, Würzburg, Bavaria, Austria, and Moravia, were independent kingdoms that all worked together. And this shows you how many people lost their lives in the Thirty Years' War. And you can see in some places, more than 50% of a population loss. Uh, let's see, I did the scientific revolution already, so let me skip that. Um, commercial revolution. There is going to be an increase in colonization during this time. Now, this is a time before capitalism, and the primary economic model is called mercantilism. Uh, basically, you have the mother country, meaning France or Sp Spain or England, something like that. You build colonies, you get as many resources from those colonies as you possibly can, and then you sell your products back to the colonies. So you basically create this closed market where you are the beneficiary and you make as much money as possible. <clears throat> All right, just a quick status update on some individual countries. Spain, uh, they're falling quickly. Um, they're hyperinflation. Their money's worthless. Portugal, uh, they get a quick start on um, exploration and building an empire, but they just don't have enough people to keep it going. Uh, the Netherlands, they recently got their independence, and they become the known shippers of the day. If you want something shipped around the world and on time, you send it to a Dutch company. And then, last but not least, England. Uh, they're staying out of all those wars that are on the mainland, and they're slowly building themselves up and slowly growing an empire while nobody's really paying attention. And eventually, England's going to become the strongest country in the world in the 1800s. Um, other little tidbits here. Uh, banking. It's usually private banks, but you do get some public banks by the 1600s. Domestic system. Um... We don't have industrialization yet, but um, in places like England and France, you're making textiles more of a, um, a conveyor belt type thing, but it's done in private homes and cottages. And we do have a second agricultural revolution. All right, almost done here. Absolutism. Uh, there was this idea that monarchies were absolute, meaning that they had total control. And it was based on the divine right of kings. And you really found this most strongly in France, but also in places like Prussia and Russia. So there's one ruler, runs the entire country. There's nobody to tell him what to do because there's no national assemblies. There's no elected body underneath him. Uh, these absolute monarchs, they've got control of the entire government. They have control of the nobility. They have large standing armies and large secret police to make sure everybody does what he says. Constitutionalism is the opposite. Um, in constitutionalism, the monarch has to share power with an elected body. Uh, for example, uh, Charles 
has to share power with Parliament today. The Parliament maintains control of the economy. The monarch has basically a figurehead role. And <clears throat> this is kind of the trend where most monarchies have gone today. All right, 20 minutes. I hope you do watch. And um, I'll try to get some more videos out this week to catch us up. And thank you for watching. We'll talk to you soon.